Hey there, Andy Robertson here with CQE Academy, and in today's video, I want to go through some of the fundamental concepts and control charts, and then talk about one of the most popular control charts out there, the X bar and R chart. All right, let's head over to the computer and dive in. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. What I'm showing here is kind of the agenda for today's lecture, so I'm going to start with talking about the two types of variation. So the beauty of a control chart is that it helps us distinguish between special and common cause variation. That's exactly why we use them, so I want to talk about what those things are. And then we're briefly going to talk about the key elements of a control chart. These are those unique features of a control chart that help us distinguish between normal and special cause variation. And then there's a really important topic in control charts called rational subgrouping, so I want to talk about that. And then we're going to go through both the equations associated with our control chart. So we're going to talk about the X bar and R chart. And we're going to talk about the equations we use to calculate the center line and the upper and lower control limit of both the X bar and the R chart. And then we're going to talk through some constants. So being able to work those equations requires that you use some constants. So I'm going to show you how to look those up and use those in your X bar and R chart calculations. And then we're going to do an example. So I'm going to show you exactly how to create an X bar and R chart. By the way, I've added uh, timestamps to each of these different slides. So if you already understand types of variation or the key elements of a control chart or maybe rational subgrouping, you can kind of jump ahead to that particular timestamp. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, so the two types of variation. Every process, no matter what we're talking about, has two types of variation. The first is common cause variation. This is the inherent normal random variation associated with your process that every process experiences when it's in control. And I'm talking about every type of process, a manufacturing process, an administrative process, maybe it's a healthcare process, it doesn't matter what it is, every process has some random, normal, common variation associated with it. Now, special cause variation is different and are things that are not unique to the process. So maybe you have a piece of equipment that's starting to wear out over time, or maybe a vendor ships you some non-conforming material, or maybe you have an operator that's new and is operating the machine differently. That's special cause variation. And as quality engineers or continuous improvement experts, we want to make sure we're monitoring our process and making sure that our processes are only experiencing common cause variation. Because if we're experiencing special cause variation, we should do an investigation, we should uncover the root causes of those special cause variations, and we should work to eliminate special cause variation. Now, the way we identify special cause variation versus common cause variation is by using a control chart. And so what you'll see here is every control chart has these upper and lower control limits. These control limits create the boundaries, you can see it here, between common cause variation and special cause variation. So we've got our upper and lower control limits here in red, and we've got, we're plotting our data here, and everything that falls between the upper and lower control limits is generally considered normal process variation. Now, what happens is, as we're plotting our data, if we run into a data point like this, that should be a sign that perhaps we're experiencing some special cause variation. And this is exactly how control charts work. We have control limits, and when we're outside of those control limits, we're likely experiencing special cause variation. Now, there are some other rules you can apply to control charts to identify special cause variation, but as a just a general rule, we do use those control limits to identify a special cause from common cause. All right, so rational subgrouping. This is a really important concept in control charts. So a rational subgroup is defined as a collection of units that are all produced under the same conditions. Now, let me tell you why that's important. So the upper and lower control limits for the X bar chart includes the average range, okay? So let me show you what I'm talking about here. Let's say we have an X bar chart and we have a subgroup sample size of five. So every time we take a subgroup, we take five measurements. And within each measurement, within each subgroup, we're calculating a range value, okay? We're calculating a range value. Now, this range value is eventually used to calculate the upper control limit for X bar. And so let's imagine we're taking this subgroup here. And let's say we take the first three data points, and then we do a, like a tooling change, or we, we change vendor lots, and we take the next two data points, okay? That would be an example of poor rational subgrouping because we've made an inherent change, okay? So when we're creating our control limits, we should make sure to collect data that's all produced under the same conditions because if the range associated with our subgroup is large, 
the control limit for our X bar chart is also going to be large. And if we have wide control limits, then we're not going to be as sensitive to changes in the variation. So the key here is that when we're picking our rational subgroup, we should only include normal inherent process variation in that rational subgroup. That's how we distinguish between common cause variation and special cause variation because we're only including common cause variation in this R bar value, okay? And then the X bar in our chart equations. So as you probably know, the X bar chart monitors the mean or the average value of your process. And here are those equations for calculating the center line and the control limit of the X bar chart. So the center line of your process is simply just called X double bar. This is the grand average. And it's really just the average of all of our average values. Now the upper control limit of X bar, so that's how you read this, upper control limit of X bar, is that grand average, that X double bar, plus A2 times R bar. Now in the next slide, I'll talk about A2, how to find that A2 factor. And then the lower control limit is that same grand average, simply minus the A2 factor times R bar. And then the range chart. So the range chart in the X bar and R chart monitors the variation within your process. So special cause variation can either change the mean value of your process or it can change the variation of your process. And we want to monitor both of those things to be able to detect special cause variation. Now here are the equations associated with the R chart. So the R bar or the average range value is simply just the average value of our measured ranges. And then the upper control limit of the range chart is the D4 factor times R bar. And the lower control limit is the D3 factor times R bar. Now I've thrown a lot of constants at you, so let's talk about that next. These are the X bar and R chart constants. So here are those equations we just talked about. And here's a, a table showing you all of the constants for the X bar and R chart. Now let's walk through these. So remember, for the upper and lower control limits of X bar, we use the A2 factor. So here's that A2 factor. And the way we find the right value is we look up the subgroup sample size. So in our example today, our subgroup sample size is going to be three, and our A2 factor is gonna be 1.023. But if in each of your rational subgroups you're taking five or seven or nine or 10, you just select a different A2 value. And then for your range chart, these are your two range factors, D3 and D4. So again, in today's example, when our subgroup sample size is three, our D3 value is going to be zero, and our D4 value is 2.575. And again, the way to look this up is just to come over here to your subgroup sample size, and then move across and find the right factor. And then the last thing to talk about is estimating the population standard deviation. So we'll actually talk about this when we talk about process capability, but we can take this R bar value from our range chart and convert it into an estimate of the population standard deviation. And we use that using this D2 factor here, this D2 factor. So again, we look this up the same way. We, we find our subgroup sample size, we come across, we find that conversion factor to convert our R bar value into an estimate of the population standard deviation. All right, so now let's work an example. So in this example, we're gonna have 10 subgroups and each subgroup is gonna have three samples. So our subgroup sample size is three. And what we do is we take our first subgroup data and we have sample values of seven, four, and four. And then what we do is we take that subgroup data and we calculate the average value and the range. So seven plus four plus four is 15, divided by three is five, so that's our average value. And the range is simply just the max minus the min, so seven minus four is three. We can do that for all of our subgroups. So here our average value is 5.7 and our range is five. Here it's 10.3 and three. Here it's 6.3 and four. And we can go on and on all the way down the list for all of our 10 subgroups. Now, once we have all of this data, we can calculate the grand average, which is X double bar. And that's simply just the average value of all of these subgroup averages. And it happens to be 7.7. .7. And then what we can do is we can take that data and we can graph the beginnings of our X bar and R chart. So here in green, you can see the center line of our process. This is our grand average. That's a 7.7. And then each of these data points is simply just the average value of the subgroups. So it's 5.0, 5.7, 10.3, 6.3, 9, 6, and on and on and on. 
We can do the same thing for the range chart. So we can find our R bar, the range center line, which is simply just the average value of all of our ranges. So if we find the average value here, it's 3.7. And we can use that to create the beginnings of our range chart. So again, the center line of our range chart is 3.7. And then you can just see we're plotting the data. So 3, 5, 3, 4, 5, 3, 3, and on and on down the list. Here you can see how we've just simply plotted those range values on the R chart. And now it's time to calculate our control limits. So here are those equations for the upper and lower control limit. So we've got X bar here and the range chart here. And we can look up those constants that we just talked about to calculate the final control limits. So our subgroup sample size is three, right? We're taking three samples per subgroup. And we know our A2 factor, our D3 factor is zero. You can see our D4 and our D2 factor. Now all we gotta do is plug these in. The upper control limit's 11.5. Lower control limit is 3.9. Now remember, these are both for the X bar chart. And then for the range chart, we plug in those D3 and D4 factors. The upper control limit is 9.3 and the lower control limit is zero. Now what we can do is we can take those control limits and overlay them on the data. So you can see here we've added the upper control limit and the lower control limit. And it looks like our process is, is in control, right? We don't have any data outside the control limits. Same thing for the range chart. So we take that previous data where we had plotted each of our range points and we can overlay the control limit. So 9.3 and zero. And again, it looks like our range values are within the control limits. All right, that is it. That is how you create an X bar and R chart using the equations and the constants. All right, that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button so other people just like you can find this exact same content. And if you loved it and you wanna take this journey to become a CQE, hit that subscribe button. So as I publish new material, it gets sent to you and you get to grow with me on this journey to become a CQE. All right, that's it. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.